Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Wall Street Notes. Today, we bring you another conversation with an industry expert. Today, we have a trailblazer in her own right. Her name is Gabriela Clivio. She is a founding member of CFA Society Chile, and she was not only the first woman to ever earn the CFA designation in the country, but she was also the third person ever in Chile to earn the CFA certification. So before we get started, please make sure to check the talking points. And if you have a question that you would like an industry expert to answer, please make sure to leave it in the comments below so that we can include it in our next conversation. Thank you for, for hopping on this call. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're, you're more than welcome. It's an honor. In fact, I am thankful that you have reached out to me because I think it's always like a great opportunity to talk about the CFA designation. I mean, when I got the designation, it was completely unknown here in Chile. Nobody knew about it. So it was kind of, I was kind of like a pioneer or a trailblazer and I had to explain to everybody what were the, the CFA for, uh, which was the meaning of the letters. And at that time, the CFA Institute did not exist. So you were granted the designation by AMER, which was the predecessor of the CFA Institute. Uh, but the, C, the AMER was like a, the, a short name for Association for Investment Management and Research. Okay. And then they, they gave you the CFA designation. So it was a mess. <laughs> I can imagine. When I, when I finished the program, I mean, uh, I remember that I was approached at that time by a recruiter from the Central Bank, the, the woman that was in charge of human resources at the Central Bank. And I thought that she was familiar with the CFA designation because her job was to recruit people, especially in the financial area, and she was not aware of the designation. So I had to explain to her, it was like, a, we're like so far away from that movement, no? <laughs> thanks, thanks God, I mean, it was difficult, it was difficult. And how, how did you get involved in the CFA? Because I know you have a, an extremely impressive background on all respects from economics to education to finance. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people know that you were the first woman in Chile to get the CFA I certification. Was, I was, I was, I was. I was the first woman and I was the third person. Congratulations. That's yeah. very few people can say that. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. In fact, when when we when we were able to put in place the, the CFA society, It took us a long time to get to the 50 people. You get 50 charter holders to put in place as a local society. So it took us a lot of time. I finished the program in 02 okay. and we put in place the society, I believe in 2015, it was either 2015 or 2016 until the moment when we were able to, when we reached the 50 charter holders. Right. When the society was not in place and not everybody was aware of the designation and what it meant and the value added to the charter, it was very difficult to convince people to volunteer, you know? Mm -hmm. And has that changed or is it still... Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Because nowadays, first of all, there is a local society. Uh, before the pandemic, the local society was very well known. There were a couple of like uh, networking events. Uh, the CFA designation as a designation, it's more recognized in the market. There's a lot of works or like uh, jobs that are offered currently within our network. Okay. So that also increased the value or of the designation, you know, so people do see um, a, a, a value of becoming a member okay. you know, of the of the of the okay. cfa because you get support uh, not only on the designation but also on the work side like you guys help out yes on that first yes way. yes 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 that's yes. great yes And you were one of the founding members of the CFA Society in Chile. What value did you see primarily that you were like, we have to put this in Chile and this has to happen? Oh, ah, in my case, for instance, uh, I was trained as an economist. My undergrad was an economy, in economics. And then I had a master's degree in economics. Mm -hmm. And I was working at the time when I finished my master's degree in economics in a, in a pension fund. Okay. okay. So my first job, I had to manage a pension fund. At that time, it was like three billion US uh, assets under management. Okay. And I was working 
on the fixed income side. Okay. No? And when I started working on that pension fund, uh, I we started the process of investing abroad, investing outside Chile. And I realized at that time that the people that gave me the better presentations, the, the, the most robust presentations, were the ones that at that time had a business card with the CFA letters on it. Okay. Interesting. So, yes. So to me, I mean, I, I correlated in a way the CFA, the, these three letters in the business cards, uh, with the type of presentation that those guys were giving me. Okay. okay. So I started to research on the program and to me it got like a, a lot of value added because investing was something or investment was something that was not taught at the university. And also at some point I decided to go a little bit deeper and instead of investing uh, abroad, outside Chile, uh, via funds or using funds, I decided to do some research on the company, so to do equity evaluation. Okay. And to me, the curriculum, the CFA curriculum was a, a very important asset to decide which companies I had to consider to invest, to invest in my portfolio. Okay. Yes. And then how yes. was your journey for, for the CFA? Did you like crank all of them in the span of two or three years or were you working yes. and studying? Yes, three years. No, I did it three years. I, I, I think that my first, I ended in 02. So I took the first one in 2000, then the second one in 01 and the third one in 02. Did you pass and them all the first time? Yes. Wow, that's crazy. How did you do that? <laughs> It, it was difficult. It was difficult because at that time I didn't know anybody that was working towards having the designation. Uh, it was like a very lonely study, no period of study because I mean there was not so much material online either because I mean it's not that internet was just beginning but everything for instance the CFA they send you the study guide by mail, by regular mail, by regular mail. But I had no one that was able to to explain to me what type of exam I, I had to I had to face, right. which is something that I have done for many people afterwards. No, so I prepare like a, like the letter of recommendation that you have to prepare for the people that are candidates after they pass the three exams. I have done, I don't know, I don't remember how many <laughs> letters I have prepared. But to me, it was like a, a very important milestone in my career to have the CFA designation. Absolutely. And, and now looking like how much it has changed in the past few years, especially with uh, Asia kind, kind of like realizing about the CFA and yes. having a higher yes. competition. A, what value do you see in your CFA certification now? To me, there was like a, a little bit of a change with the designation because currently, I mean, very young people are working to have, to have their designation. Now, in my time, it was like a professional certificate that very like a seasoned, seasoned professional, like experienced professional, who wanted to have like a, an updated curriculum. Yeah. And I do believe that currently what happened was that the CFA has attracted very young professionals or very young students, students that are finishing their undergrad and are working towards having their designation. And uh, that has broadened the awareness in Asia, for instance, but not in Latin America. That's true. Do you think that's a, that's an issue in the current work environment or? I think that the CFA missed the point of not, um, of not working um, harder to engage companies in that time, mm -hmm. no? Because I think that in a way, um, people in the U.S. people in the U.S. are very very aware of the designation. Yes. 
same thing happens in Canada. When I used to live, I, I, le I, I have been living for two years in Canada, and people in Canada are very, very aware of the designation, of the importance of the designation. So basically, the Institute, through the local society, does not need to be present because the market itself, I mean, is very aware of the importance of the designation. You will not find people managing assets that don't have the designation. Yeah. You won't see that, no? But in LATAM, I do believe that the Institute has to increase their presence so that employers are aware of the code of ethics that the candidates or charter holders do have to abide um, or the standards that they do have in, in mind or the, the knowledge that is embedded on the curriculum. I think that this is well beyond the, what the local societies can do. I think that this is something that the CFA Institute has to step in, like uh, through, I don't know, like um, the relationship between the Institute and the local societies, or through engaging in like uh, conversations with like um, local players, like Latin American bands, or mm -hmm. empowering women, or doing other kinds of events that local societies are not gonna be putting in place or organizing but the institute does know how to do it but in the last i would say maybe the last decade the institute was so much focused on india and china and hong kong because there was a huge amount of candidates coming from those areas that latam was not the focus of the institute. Yeah, we, I understand that. But if if you had more support on the LATAM side, maybe just introducing the idea of the CFA at an earlier stage just so that more people understand the value of it, do you think that would be useful for candidates? That would be useful for sure. That would be useful for sure. But I also think that, I mean, it, it has to be... Um, it has to be on the agenda of employers. Because if you, if you introduce those concepts uh, at the undergrad level, you will introduce those concepts in, in one side of the market, no? On, on, on this side of the students or potential candidates or the workforce. But I do believe that there has to be also, uh, some, there is some work to be done uh, on the employer side. Right. 100%. on the employer side a very few of those senior positions have the cfa designation and this should not be the case a hundred percent and there i think a study last year by the cfa actually noted how many candidates for level one there were throughout the world and i think latin america like mexico and latin america only made up two percent um, and knowing that we're at least 10 percent of the world population and that number right. seemed extremely small Right. Correct. So the question Correct. would be, what what is it that we're missing, that clearly? What, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you, because I mean the the missing part is to build awareness on the employers of on the importance of having, uh, at least on the financial industry, the importance of having women on boards and the importance of having uh, CFA uh, professionals on their. On top the line executives oh for sure and then in terms of like since since you uh, have worked with the cfa certification under your belt right what would you say is the biggest value of having the cfa certification is it on an ent entering the job like do they see your application better or is it in terms of like the knowledge you've internalized that m helps you perform better at the job no, from my perspective, but maybe it's like a little bit biased, Amanda, because in, um, in my case, no, in my case, no one was aware of the designation. So right. to me, the, the, the greatest value was the knowledge that I have acquired. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Currently, it has helped people uh, to gain access to some type of entry level work that you need to have at least like a level one to be considered for to be considered to have those 
But I think having considered that, having said that, I also consider that it has been like a, there is like a, there is more consciousness on the fact that if you have level one, you're able to get into some of entry level position. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that the most senior positions are reserved for to people that have the designation. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. So I attach like a great value to the body of knowledge that is on the designation. Mm -hmm. no? Right. And then in terms of like uh, spreading the word or at least having more uh, candidates in Chile, for example, because I know the Chilean education system on a university level is one of the top ones in Latin America. Um, why hasn't there been more support on the CFA level to maybe start introducing it there or on the on the scholarship level as well? Oh, I can tell you that for sure, because I work in one university in the Master in Finance program, and that university has like a partnership with the CFA Institute, with a CFA designation. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of my students, after they finish their degree, they, they keep on studying to have the CFA designation. The, okay. the problem or what, what is important is like a, to work with the university, to work with the university, to for the partnership to be a true partnership. Because I know another university that has a partnership with the CFA Institute, for instance, but they never participated on the research challenge. Okay. Why? Because the, even if the students want to participate, even if the students want to participate in the research challenge, there is no professor that wants to tutor them and then the other thing is that uh, particip they, don't de they don't get credits for participating in the research challenge. Also, the incentive however, is not there. However, in the other university, they get credits mm -hmm. if they participate in the research challenge. So at some point, I see that the, the CFA Institute, they put in place partnerships where they don't do the check and balances and they don't force the universities to really commit themselves towards pushing students or like uh, building awareness on the CFA designation. It's a partnership, but they're not really partners. Right. I mean, the universities are not really partners. That's the thing. Okay. And what do you think that is? Uh, because I think that in the case of Universidad de Chile, for instance, I am going to work with the local society to have the, the partnership for, the, um, for one of the programs. That's one thing. But then for Universidad Católica, it's, it's like a, such an important university. They don't feel the need to attract students because the students, they want to be part of that university. So for them to have or don't have the CFA uh, program partnership, it's not like, um, it's not something that they view as, okay, we have it, there is a commitment. Unfortunately, there is no commitment from their side. I mean, okay. from their side. Oh, that's interesting. So it's almost yeah. like they, they already get enough of an influx of students to add to yeah. their offerings. That's yeah, yeah. So for them, I mean, the fact that the, the students, um, maybe their students are not so well equipped when they go to the market in terms of knowledge, mm -hmm. but they have built such a great network while they were at the university that maybe even though they were not able uh, to have like a very deep knowledge, they have the connections to get to have access to very good jobs. Right. So the university itself at the undergrad level is not very worried about the possibility that the students don't get very good jobs. Okay, understood. And then on, on your end, in terms of like people that maybe you're looking to bring into your team or into your companies, do you consider the CFA as an important aspect? Yes, for sure. 100%. Okay. That's really interesting. 100%. 100%, but not only for the, the knowledge, uh, because I know that someone that got the designation is someone that is very committed to, to studying, to keep on perfecting himself or herself. So mm -hmm. someone that 
got out of the university like uh, I don't know like 10 years ago that can be uh, like a very mid-career level or very senior level if you have not opened the book in the last 10 years you're gonna be completely outdated so yeah. I view like uh, the CFA designation as someone that wants to keep on learning which is like a very positive attitude to me mm -hmm. no and someone that is committed to a very high ethical standards, someone that I know that is like a, has a duty to its employer, a duty to client. So it reflects on the value of someone, no? Yeah. It's not only about the very specific or financial knowledge. It's oh. also about values, about like a, the way you want to keep on progressing. So it's a lot of things that you can, a lot of information that it's embedded in that designation. Yeah, I got you. It's more kind of like a well-rounded thing. It's not only the Correct. technical aspect, it's right. things. Ah, okay. Yeah. On top of that, sometimes I, know, I do need someone that is really proficient in English, and I know that someone that has been able to complete the three levels and, and the exams in English is able to understand a conversation, to write a report, to make a presentation, so it's also one of the reasons no oh that's true yeah because most of the finance world does predominantly like happen right. in english so it is something that you right. to know. that's true and you also have the kaya right yes okay so in terms of like certifications in general right my question is are certifications an important asset to have regardless of your your level of education like masters or undergrad? I think they are. I think they are. In Chile, if you want to work in the financial industry, there is no way you're going to be there if you don't have like a university degree. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, but in a way, the international credentials, most of all, what they give you is like um, when you've come from different backgrounds, the international degrees or certifications are the only way to have that recognition, no? True. And then my, my last question before before uh, we can wrap this up, um, you're very involved in the whole aspect of women in business and women in finance. And yes. So uh, if, if you want to tell us a little bit about that, but also kind of related to how the CFA or certifications like that can put women more or less on the map. Is that something that they can do to break through the glass ceiling, how they say? Or it would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. I mean, I I decided to be more involved in the women in finance like uh, area because at some point I got fed up that I was the only woman seated on the table and, and no one and I am not like a, I don't consider myself a very shy person, but it, it happened to me that I was, I, I, I was on a table and no one was talking to me. So, oh, wow. yeah, so, and, and, it, and it was awful, you know, it was awful. So at some point I was teaching a course in an MBA program and a student of mine who was a VP from BlackRock, she approached me after we finished the course and she said, okay, you know what? I mean, I know that you're part of the CFA local society. Uh, we want to do things together with the society. Mm -hmm. And I, and I told her, no, I didn't know what she, where she was working at that time. And I said, okay, but I am not from the CFA Institute. I am like, a, I'm, I'm a board member of the local society. And she said, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> And I and, and that's where she introduced herself and she told me I work for from Black, for BlackRock and we want to be like kind of like a sponsor. And I told her that we were looking for sponsors because I mean we needed to to fund the events that we wanted to have in place. And since the course has ended and I was not the professor anymore, we went we had lunch together and we invited other women and we put in place the women in finance uh, that like a how do you say it? it's a network that we okay. put in place okay. uh, as i told you she was working in blackrock and there was another woman who was working in bank of america at that time okay and we wanted uh, and then like uh, unfortunately we put in place that society we invited we invited other women and i was transferred to canada the woman that worked in blackrock was transferred to new york and the other woman was transferred to sao paulo Wow. Um, so 
Two years afterwards, I came back to Chile and the network that Women in Finance Network is still in place. Um, but I think and I would like to see more women and more women on the financial industry. And I don't see women on boards of financial institutions. I don't see women on boards on like our brokerage houses. There's like a very limited number of women that I can see. I can only think of one woman that sits on the board of Scotiabank and the rest of the banks, I have no visibility of women. Wow. So that's something that, that it definitely has to change, but I do really appreciate all yes. the efforts that, that you and, and your yeah. organizations have taken towards that. Because um, yeah. it also gives a different perspective, you know? It's not like we're negating the current one, it's just adding to it. And sometimes yeah. it's it's a little bit uh, more difficult to get through that first initial barrier. Yes. For me, from, from my personal perspective, it has not been easy. No, but you're the perfect example that it can be done. <laughs> yeah, I know, but because I'm stubborn. <laughs> what would you say is your greatest contributor to your success? Like, is it a specific mindset? Is it your work ethic? What do you think, like, for someone that also wants to be a trailblazer, maybe listening to this, what would you, what would well, be Well, that's, that's the, the, the desire to make a change to contribute from my from my with my own expertise to bring more women to the to the industry uh, the fact that i was able in a way to to how do you say to i was able to manage my personal life with my professional life for sure the fact that i work a lot and, and, and that also made it possible in a way because it's more difficult for a woman. I mean, in Chile, women are in, in charge of everything at home. So it's also very difficult to balance. So it, it was a, a combination of things. No, and being straightforward, I think it was like, a, it was also difficult because when you are straightforward, you, you save a lot of time, but you can also be viewed. I was viewed, I myself, I was viewed as someone that was like a very confrontational, but I was not confrontational. I had lo not so much time to lose in like a endless discussion. Yeah. So I said, okay, Just if I am able to, to manage yeah. and to save time, let's go straight to the point. And in my case, that was a key, but it also brought me like a problems, you know, because being straightforward in a society that tends to sugarcoat everything, <laughs> it's not very easy, but it was my way to save time. True. Well, that's, that's a really good point. But, um, yeah. but thank you, Gabriela, so much for, for coming here. You're it's more than welcome. Time. You're more than welcome whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.